sin, says several times this week, is that uh, we all need to work toward infinite patience. So, something to think about. And, uh, so to connect with uh, the math, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little background on the math. The math was pioneered by a man named Marco Rodin. Um, he lived on the Big Island for a while. He's worked with the sim a little bit too. And he's now in Southern California. And Marco has been working on this math for about 40 years. And he's uh, one of the most exceptional pattern recognitions I've ever met. He can pick out a pattern from anywhere. And he started to see patterns within our base 10 system. Now it wasn't just this um, system to understand quantity, but it was also a system to understand geometry. And so, with traditional mathematics, we use the number line, and it's quantitative information. It's linear, it's massive. With vortex mathematics, we use a number circle. The number circle is cyclical, it's qualitative, it's a feminine perspective. One of the uh, oldest symbols um, found in cultures and it's found in alchemy is a dot within a circle. So when I'm standing here, the center of this dome, say I'm that dot within the circle. I'm the, I'm the perceiver, what around me is the perspective. And every different perspective has a different piece of information. However, when the quantity comes in, the quantity is energy. The farther something is away from me, the less energy it has. And we're going to concepts of spin and how spin is related to the singularity and the distance from the singularity. And you can understand these abstractions in the math. The hard thing that people have been having with this math is taking these abstractions, making them concrete, bringing them into this reality, understanding the interpretations of the math and translating them to physics. And that's what my work is, is mostly focused on, is taking the abstractions and grounding them, materializing them, such as with that coil, with that coil of that. So, I'll send this guy around. This was made in my machine shop in Asheville. It's a steel coil. It's made with uh, three bars of steel. They are heated up and twisted to a triple helix. That triple helix is then bent around a cylinder and it's welded to itself. This is then heated up um, to where it's red hot and it's cooled in a magnetic field. So what's interesting about this is there's no leakage of the magnetic field. And really, I'm going to start using the term in this discussion, magnetic flow. Field is really a, a bad term to really understand what's actually happening. Uh, physicists call it a field because its oscillation, its frequency is so high, it seems solid. Just like uh, our vision, if something's above 60 frames per second, it looks solid. And so it's really a flow of energy. When you have a, a bar magnet, uh, a horseshoe magnet, you take it to a monitor, you'll see how it's, it gets distorted. Well, if you take a steel bar and connect that horseshoe magnet to itself, and then bring it up to the monitor, you'll get very little distortion because that flow of energy is now circulating in that magnet. That's what's happening with this. And so, it's creating an energy pump. And there's energy being pulsed through the core of this, but it's not reversing. It pulses and then it slows down. It pulses and then it slows down. You don't have a reversal of energy. And so, that's one of the big problems with, actually I'm gonna send this around. You guys can play with it and experience it. Um, one of the things we're utilizing for our energy systems is uh, impulse DC, um, direct current. And how you can relate this to yourself is understanding different flows of energy. Direct current, energy is flowing one way. AC is flowing back and forth, back and forth. AC is an unnatural form of energy, actually very detrimental to us. What we're using is impulse DC, where you pulse your energy and then you wait for the universe to send it back. When you're using AC, you're, you're wasting energy by pushing it one way and then pushing it another way. And so a uh, visualization to help you with this is think of a spring. And with AC, you're twisting up the spring, and then you're helping it untwist and twist in the other way. And you can just twist up the spring and do nothing, and it'll untwist for you. And then you can twist it up again, and then let it untwist for you. And so it's creating an oscillation within polarities. And so with AC, you're moving between yin and yang, yin and yang, going back and forth, back and forth. 
when the way we're building our energy systems is you're, you're isolating the polarities. You're having yin over here and yang over here, but the yin is oscillating between itself and neutral, or you could say itself and source. There's not a reversal in polarity. And there's a man named Tom Bearden, who's down in uh, Alabama. He uh, helped develop HARP. He did not mean HARP to do what it's being used for now, but a very, very brilliant man. Um, his, one of the main sayings he would say all the time is, don't kill the polarity. Maintain the polarity. And when we, when we hook the battery to itself, we start to kill the bit polarity right there. We start to let the pressure go. We really want our energy systems to function like nature. And so with the devices we've been building, it's focusing on biomimicry. How do we replicate Mother Nature? And so one of the main things we've been studying is a hurricane, how a hurricane works. And a hurricane maintains its polarities between the outside force, which is the more, which is the masculine, it's more apparent, spinning counterclockwise if it's in the northern hemisphere, but there's also the core of the hurricane. The core of the hurricane is the feminine energy and spinning clockwise. Um, and it's, it's sparse while the outside is dense. You're having two different, you have compression around expansion. And it's maintaining those polarities. And so the idea with what we're trying to do is how do you use polarities to feed off each other, just like we do with each other, um, like you can do with dance. And so let's, let's go on to the, the vortex map. And we use, a, we use a number circle that's divided into nine parts. And you can do any number system. Different number systems have different results. The most interesting is to use nine numbers. It's still a base 10 system because the zero is the whole. The zero is the midpoint. The zero is the balance of the system. And the, there's nine qualitative perspectives of the system. And so people might have used the use something called integrated digits before, where you take any number, it's usually done in numerology, you add up all the digits to get a single digit, a single qualitative piece of information. So if we're counting around this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, this becomes 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, one and six is seven. 29 would be two plus nine is 11, one plus one is two. So you're taking all numbers and just breaking them down to, to nine, numbers, nine qualities, and each of these numbers has its own specific quality. The number I said, it doesn't exist, it's irrelevant. What does exist is the geometry created by the number, it's just the triangle is inherent with nature, not the number three. And so, one of the simplest uh, sequences we play around with in the math is the doubling sequence. And the doubling sequence The doubling sequence starts with a 1, and it goes from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, which is 7, 1 and 6 is 7, uh, six, uh, 16 and 16 is 32, so 3 and 2 is 5, and then 32 and 32 is 64, 6 and 4 is 10, 1 and 0 is 1. And then 128, 1, 2, and 8 is 11, 1, and 1 is 2. So what I'm showing you right here is that there's a cyclical pattern within this doubling sequence. It also works in the other direction, right? In terms of habit, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125, 0 0.0625. And so you can take any of these numbers and break it down, and you'll get this single qualitative number, and it shows a cyclical pattern. It's a pattern based off the number 6. Six is the number of creation. And so the doubling sequence itself, as I said, doesn't exist. This is me making an abstraction of an observation of nature. What does exist is the Star of David, the hexagram. The Star of David is the embodiment of this doubling sequence. So this, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna start with talking about dimensions and our dimensions of reality. And the simplest dimension is the zero dimension. The zero dimension is a dot. So, as I said, I was just hanging out with the sim a few days before this, and 
the big discussion or, or uh, constructive argument we're having was the notion of singularities and, and boundary planes. And it was sort of a discussion between abstraction and what's actually real. And Nassim was saying that the core, that a singularity has volume. And that a singularity cannot be a single point in space and that it must have volume. That every aspect of our reality has volume. And I was, I was arguing this with him and um, using examples uh, and uh, things I saw in nature and that he saw in nature. And then I made a statement, which I talked about earlier, the dot within the circle. And I used to say this all the time, and when I said this, I was like, oh, you're actually right. And that when you look at the dot within the circle and you zoom in on that dot, you'll see another circle with another dot. And so what Nassim said is that singularity is, has volume, but it's full of more singularities. And every other singularity has volume, but it's full of more singularities. And that you can never truly reach that singularity. So this is the aspect of the zero dimension. It's a singularity. It's a dot in space. But it's a dot that's forever approaching the infinite. And it's a gateway to the infinite. And so what we're trying to do in these energy systems well, there's two processes, two alchemical processes, manifestation and transmutation. All of our energy systems are based on transmutation. Manifestation is learning to understand these dimensions and how these dimensions interconnect. They interconnect through geometry, through specific geometrical processes. We can understand these processes, a big part of it being the vortex, and how to create this geometry to a singularity, you can start to access the infinite. You can start to pull uh, say pull energy from the infant, but it's manifesting energy from the infant. There's an infant amount of balance in the source. And so how do you polarize this infinite balance and bring it into our reality? And so this is what we're trying to understand with geometry. And so from the zero dimension, we move into the first dimension. And the first dimension is typically taught as a line. So we're going to shift our perspective here and talk it, about it from a cyclical perspective. And say that the first dimension is actually a circle. But we're going to view it in terms of topology. This is just about the surface of the circle. The circle is a boundary layer between the internal and the external. And you could sort of ignore that there's volume on the inside and there's volume on the outside. That's irrelevant at the moment. What's important is just the boundary layer. This idea relates to uh, hollow earth theory in that everything really is hollow and there's just boundaries. We're just, we're just interacting with boundaries. Right now you're interacting with the boundary of me, the internal and the external. We're on the boundary of the land and the ocean. Most things in reality happen around the boundary layers. It's the, uh, the focal points of interaction. And so, in the first dimension, in the math, are these are sequences. They're sequences that move one direction. And through understanding them through numbers, you can see how these sequences dance. But really all these sequences are, are just different forms of oscillations, different forms of vibrations. And so when we're looking at these numbers, you can say it's like the matrix code of these vibrations. You can see how these vibrations interact with each other. And so the simplest one is just a linear sequence coming from 1 to 9. However, that has a polar relationship with the number 8. 1 and 8 add up to 9. And so you're having polar relationships between the 1 and the 8, the 2 and the 7, the 3 and the 6, and the 4 and the 5, 9 self-reflected. You'll start to understand the importance of the 9 as I move through this math, and the trinity, the 3, 6, and the 9. So how the 8 is polar to the 1 is if I start counting by 8, 8, 16, 1 and 6 is 7, 24, 2 and 4 is 6, 32, 3 and 2 is 5, um, 40, uh, 4 and 0 is 4. And so counting by 8, I'll continually go around the circle in this direction, showing this qualitative pattern of 8. Same with counting by the 1, going this way. And so 1 and 8 are polarized to each other. And so the 2 and the 7, we have counting by 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, um, 14. Do, does everyone understand what I'm doing with the numbers and breaking them down? Is anyone confused by this? 
All right. And so counting by seven in the other direction, we have seven, 14, one, four is five, uh, tw uh, 21, 28, and 35. And so you're, again, pull a relationship between the two and the seven. And then there's a relationship of the four and the five. And so if you've noticed, the numbers I'm choosing at the moment, these six, are all the six numbers of the doubling sequence. And I'm leaving out the trinity at the moment. Counting by four, we have four, eight, twelve, um, I'm going to make this a little So you guys can actually see the geometry of what's existing. So with the counting by four, we got four, eight, twelve, um, 16, 20, 24, uh, 28, um, 32, 36, and back to 40. Alright. It's not a perfect star, but there's a star. And so, this piece of geometry has two, two ways to perceive it. If you go one direction, it relates to the number four. If you go the other direction, it relates to the number five. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45. And so these six numbers, the one, the two, four, the five, um, and the uh, seven, the eight, these are all the six numbers of the doubling sequence. And the six numbers of creation. The three and the six has a different relationship in terms of its polar information. All six of these numbers contain all nine numbers in some form of an order. But the three and the six, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen. And the six, six, twelve, eighteen, twenty-four, thirty. And so three and six contain only three numbers in these linear sequences. And so there is a, it's a different level of a relationship. And so six numbers contain nine numbers. These two numbers contain three numbers. And the nine is self-reflective. Nine, 18, 27, 36, nine always adds up to nine. And so you're seeing a trinity relationship between these nine numbers. There's a relationship of the six, there's a relationship of the two, and there's a relationship of the one. And so this aspect of a trinity relationship is found all throughout the math. This is at the very base level of the math, the simplest form of it in the first dimension. In the first, after the first dimension, it starts to fractalize at a dramatic, dramatic rate. Um, I spend most of my time working with information in the second dimension. There's a world of information in the second dimension. Not a ton in the first, but in the second it fractalizes a ridiculous amount. In the third dimension, it's, it's a whole other ballgame. That's what Nassim is working with, with the uh, tetrahedrons. And so, as I was saying, there's only actually one vector of information when I'm talking about counting by four. That, if you visualize this as, a, as an oscillation, you, you could draw out the numbers on the oscillation to see the information in it. That's just a way we're interpreting it. However, that oscillation is only going in one direction. Once we get to the second dimension, which I'll show you the, the process of connection, how you make that step, make that leap, there's eight vectors of information. When you get up to the third dimension, there's 64 vectors of information, which relates to the Sims tetrahedral grid. And so the fourth dimension contains 512 vectors of, um, of information. And so it becomes much, much more complex and harder to wrap your mind around. Um, the first dimension is extremely simple compared to the rest. But uh, the second dimension, the second dimension relates to the torus um, that's being handed around right now. And so it's the donut. But the thing about the donut is we're just focused on the surface area of the donut. We're staying with this notion of topology. What's inside and outside of the donut is irrelevant at the moment to understanding the math. And so... Um, So to get to the second dimension requires a kinetic process. It requires two opposing energies to collide into each other. So let's imagine this as a sequence, as this oscillation. 
And this is that same oscillation, but in opposing vector. So there are two opposing energies coming and colliding into each other. Now, from our observation, it seems linear. But when these two linear energies collide, physics would traditionally say that the energies cancel out. They cancel out, and that dimensional level of energy is converted to a different form of energy. This relates to overlapping magnetic fields. As physicists will say, if you overlap two opposing magnetic fields, they cancel out. They're not existence. But there's also this lovely law which they throw at us, um, the free energy movement law, the second law of thermodynamics. Our energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. And that's just, that's the truth of it. And it gets converted to a different form of dimensional awareness. And when they collide together, they expand into a radial form of information. And so if you look at our galaxy, there's two black holes compressing energy in the center of our galaxy, and it's creating a radial system outwards. And so the process of it creating this radial system actually is visualized as a torus. And so, can I get someone to clean this off for me while I keep talking? Want to do it? Oh, it's coming off. Wax on, wax off like this, y'all. Yeah, the whole thing. This is fine. So, what happens when you overlap these pieces of information? What happens in the math? is it creates an 18 number sequence. And so before I was talking about nine number sequences, now we're moving up to 18 number sequences, and they're interweaving. And so if I wrote this, this whole sequence out, you can count one way, skipping every number, one, two, three, four, five, and you count the other way, one, two, three, four, five. And so you're getting into higher forms of information, more complex forms of information. What that starts to do is it starts to create different energy dynamics. And it allows you to create Taurus. I'm going to need this to show you how to do this because you can only talk about it so much. It's a very visual thing. Um, where's my boy? Awesome. Alright, so while we're waiting for that, I'll do a little demonstration with some poi. And so, if you're not familiar with poi, poi come from uh, New Zealand, from the Maui tribe. And uh, poi are really great at understanding physics. And so, as it's on the basis, torque, and understanding torque. And so I'm going to talk about the trinity and how to understand the trinity. And so gravity, gravity has been this illusion with us for quite a while. What gravity really is, or what we're experiencing for gravity, is centripetal force. It's a, it's a spiraling down, while centrifugal force is a spiraling away. And so if you think of the, let's talk about hollow earth theory, let's just visualize this concept for a second, and think of the crust of the Earth. The crust, it's, it's, it's understanding layers, and that the atomic shell has layers of electrons, even though electrons are even a bad term that will put us in the wrong direction of understanding energy by creating this particle. But there's, there's shells, there's layers, just like the moon is in a specific location going around the Earth, and the Earth is in a specific location going around the sun, and the rings of Saturn it's this layering system. As above, so below, you can apply this concept to everything, including the, the layering structure of the Earth. And so, with hollow Earth theory, the crust is, is double-sided. And that, at the center of the crust is what we would consider a gravitic node. It's, it's your point, it's your center of gravity. But there's multiple centers of gravity. And the simplest way to understand this is if there's a singularity in the center of the Earth, it's radiating a vibration. Whenever this vibration expands and then collapses again, it creates another singularity. It creates another gravitic node. And so you get multiple places where there's center of gravity, and matter can build up in these centers of gravity. But there's, so let's imagine that the end of this poi is the surface of the Earth. It's the crust, okay? Now what you're seeing is you're, you're able to see the masculine force very easily. You're able to see the centrifugal force getting pulled out to this point. Right? That's what usually when people think you're spinning point, oh, you're just experiencing centrifugal force. 
but there's always equal and opposite reactions. So if there's centrifugal force going out, then there's centripetal force going in. And so you're seeing the masculine energy going out to this poi and holding it nice and taut. But what you're not seeing is a centripetal force being pulled inwards to the poi. Every time you start spinning something, you're creating that centripetal force spiraling in toward this poi. The, more, the faster I spin it, the more those forces polarize. There's always an equal and opposite exchange of those two forces. And so if you're on the inside of hollow earth, you'd be experiencing for gravity the centrifugal force as you're getting th uh, thrown outwards. But what we're experiencing is centrifugal force being pulled inwards. This relates to the, the Coriolis effect. And so we usually consider gravity as a linear force. But we all, we all know that when we flush our toilets, it spins a certain direction. And the hurricanes in the northern hemisphere, as I said, spin counterclockwise. That's related to centripetal force. That's the cyclical aspect of centripetal force. What we consider gravity to be this linear force is the linear portion of centripetal force. The blue doesn't come off. The blue doesn't come off? It's coming off better now that I'm waxing on and waxing off. <laughs> but it's an effort. Water? Yeah. It came off earlier. Oh man, it comes off so nice when there's no effort, but I mean something. Here, I can, I can use it as this. Alright, use it as it is. Let's dry it off. Because you were using a, a red Sharpie on a board, and I thought it would be better than the prism color. Oh. I mean, the prism color would be better. Brilliant, and you have many colors. I have Sharpies as well. Make a work of art, believe it. Yeah. It's your canvas. It's your canvas, the picture of me. Let's just call it good. So now I'm just gonna, I'm gonna draw out a matrix. This matrix is gonna appear to be 2D and linear, but really the way to perceive it is through um, a toroidal perspective. Now I'll go through the steps, explain that, and hopefully no one will get lost. This has been the trick I've been really working on is how to communicate this concept, put it into quality of language so we all can understand. So any feedback, if you're not getting it, let me know. Mm -hmm. What the connection between centripetal force and gravity? So, all, what I'm basically saying is that they made up a term called gravity and called centripetal force gravity. But we also consider gravity just to be a linear force. And so we can combine the line with the circle, you get the spiral. The spiral is actually how reality manifests. But there's the masculine feminine energies that are creating the spiral. And so within the, so I'm saying centripetal force is a spiral. And that there's two forces that, that cause it to manifest. One is the Coriolis effect, um, or we see the Coriolis effect happening. But even, but when you, when you say have a, a uh, tub, and you pull that drain, they're saying the Coriolis effect is causing it to twist, and that gravity is pulling it down. But that's all centripetal force. It's all the same thing. They're just different perspectives of the same thing. The Coriolis effect is what we consider to be the rotation, and gravity is what we consider to be the linear acceleration. But those are just pieces of what the force actually is. And the force is a spiraling down motion. So, so it seems like everything is a movement in reality. Yes, absolutely. Taking a snapshot and then trying to explain it in like as if it was fixed. And yes. Why everything is wrong with that? Yes. With that so one of the things, at least for me growing up, I always considered time to be movement. But when I was talking about in the first dimension, these sequences that they're in oscillation. There's movement in the first dimension. There's movement in the second dimension. It's all kinetic energy. Everything is moving. And so, if everything is moving, then what really is the fourth dimension? So that's a whole different topic of what really time is. Um, but everything has motion, and it's it's the only way things can manifest. Without without motion, there's there's just source. And so, when you uh, I said when you collide these two energies together, it creates a matrix. I'm 
I'm going to draw this out really quickly. That's going to be dark. I have a follow-up question. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, again, on the centrifugal and centripetal force, like you use the ploy as an mm -hmm. example. If you were to let go of the ploy, it would go flying outwards. Yes. So I'm, I'm a little confused. I'm trying to graph as well the centripetal force that's holding it in. There's a, there's a main, when I'm using that ploy in that example, there's a huge differential between those two forces. And so that's the importance of the golden ratio, is understanding the differential. And that's um, the imbalance between the energies. And so for reality to manifest, you need an imbalance of masculine and feminine energies. You need more outward force than inward force. Otherwise, it just stays still. And so that relates to why the Sri Yantra has five masculine triangles, four feminine triangles. And so one of the fundamental ratios that we work with in our systems is the golden ratio, because the golden ratio is how you build energy. Um, it's a dynamic ratio between yin and yang energies. So just to kind of clarify,